Okay, I want to go over simulated annealing. Um, so what we've been talking about is given a model with parameters, parameters say P, uh, and we have some experimental data, data. What are the best values for the parameters in the model such that the model uh, matches the experimental data? And that problem is an optimization problem um, where we optimize the sums of squares. We basically had the chi-squared, which is effectively the sums of squares, where we took the difference between the uh, model and the data. Okay, then we squared. We basically had the sums of squares. And the objective was the smaller this is, this is the better the fit. Okay, that was the uh, that was the objective, and the method we described first was something called gradient descent. Okay, gradient descent. Essentially, what that happens, what that involves, let's say we had a one-dimensional system with one parameter, and we plotted the chi-squared. We plotted the chi squared, we might get something that looks like that. So this direction is the chi squared, and this direction is the parameter. This clearly is the, the minimum. Okay, so this is the, the value, this is the best parameter, best P, okay? And we're trying to find that, this minimum. And the way we do that with gradient descent, we have to pick some random value for the parameter initially. Let's say we picked a value for the parameter there. Uh, that gives us a chi-squared. And with gradient descent, what we do is we compute the slope at this point and we move down the slope. And we keep doing this in an iterative manner. We keep doing this, repeating this operation until hopefully we arrive at the minimum. Okay, this is gradient descent. Um, the problem with gradient descent is um, it'll, wherever you start the parameter, it'll find the nearest minimum. Now for complex models, it turns out that the, the chi-squared surface isn't as simple as uh, a, a bow like this, but it can be more complex. For example, it could look, look something like that. So we have our chi-squared here, and we have our parameter along here. And you have to imagine this in n dimensions, okay? So we're not just one dimensional. And it's possible there could be multiple minima. So this would be a low, what's called a local minimum. And then this one here, which is obviously lower, this is what we would call the global minimum, okay? Our objective is to find this one, not this one. The problem is if we were to accidentally say start here, we wouldn't go, we wouldn't find the global minimum, but we'd find the minimum minimum, which is not a, which is not the right one. So we need an alternative algorithm to deal with situations like this. And the simulated annealing is one such algorithm. There are a whole battery of such methods. They're all called global optimization methods. Simulated annealing is a popular one and it's fairly effective. And this is what we're going to describe here. So what's the difference then between, what's the essential difference between gradient descent and simulated annealing? So let's, let's write this out again. So I'm gonna call gradient descent GD, simulated annealing SA, and I'm gonna draw the objective function for gradient descent and objective function for simulated annealing. The difference, the essential difference is this. With gradient descent, I will always move down, always. With simulated annealing, I can move up or down, okay? And of course, if you're in n-dimensional space, there are many directions one could move in, all right? So that is the essential difference. And the idea is that by being able to move up, I might be able to get out of a local minimum and end up in a, in a global minimum, okay? So you can imagine that if we had a surface like this and I was here, so if I use simulated annealing, I might move in that direction. And now look, and now I'm in the right, in the right uh, minimum to find the global minimum. OK, 
Okay, so that's that's the uh, the subtle that's the main difference between gradient descent and simulated annealing. So how does the algorithm work? Um, so the algorithm. Let's first give you a short version. So. So we, let's say we have um, a set of P. So we have a set of parameters, set of parameters, P, okay? What we'll do is we'll move P in some random direction. Uh, what we'll likely do is we'll probably draw a number from a normal distribution centered on P, and then we'll add that uh, normal num that normally distributed number to P. So we only move, you know, locally around P. We don't suddenly jump off into uh, far away from P. So what we'll end up with is a, a new P. Let's call it P plus one. And we get that by taking the original P, let's call that PI, and adding some change delta P. Now I compute, now I then ask myself, in moving from PI to PI plus one, am I in a better place or not? Um, that means, have I moved closer to the minimum or further away? Okay, if I'm in a better, in a, if I'm in a better position, if better position, okay, well, that sounds good. In which case, uh, yes, then I'll go back and try another and try to move move the parameters again. And I can ask the, uh, I can ask whether I'm in a better position again and I keep going round and round. This is sort of similar to gradient de descent except that the, the change in the, in the P doesn't necessarily guarantee a better position, okay? So what happens if there's no, if we're in the worst position, i.e. we've moved up rather than down. So no, we're in a worse position. Then what happens is we go into what I'll just call for the moment a magic box, okay? And two things, one of two things can happen with this magic box. The magic box either says accept, right? Even though it's a worse position, accept and go around again. Or the magic box says, so it's or the magic box says, no, 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 reject. I don't want to use this uh, new parameter set P I plus one, reject, try again. So that's basically the essential uh, algorithm. The question is what's happening in the magic box. That's basically the secret of simulated annealing. Um, well, I can, I can express the magic box in actually just two lines. So the magic box, Two things, um, early on, so remember this is an iterative process, right? We go round and round and round. So early on in the iteration, uh, we generally will accept bad moves frequently, okay? So early on, if we ever get a bad mood, we'll say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll pick it. I, I want that bad move, okay? Later on, so this is now later on in the iterations, maybe, you know, 50 iterations later. Later on, we will reject bad moves, uh, moves frequently. Okay, that's basically what, what the magic box will do. So early on in the iteration, it'll accept bad moves very often. As the iterations proceed, it'll start moving to the second one where it now starts to reject bad, bad moves more frequently. So if you imagine what's happening here in accepting bad moves, it's basically bouncing around the, um, the surface of the objective function trying all, all places, okay? Um, now, if it, if it ends up in a global minimum, it'll take longer to get out of that than if it landed in a local minimum. So here it is bouncing around, accepting bad moves all the time. Uh, in, as it does so, it'll either, it could either 
end up in a local minimum or, or the global minimum. If it ends up in a local minimum, it'll probably find itself bouncing out quite easily because it's pretty shallow. On the other hand, if it ends up in a global minimum, it'll probably find itself um, uh, having more difficulty to get, get out of that. So maybe I can explain it, maybe I can explain it this way. So let's uh, do this. So here I am, I'm in a, a local minimum. Um, I'm bouncing around. Uh, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm at early on in the iteration, so I'm accepting bad moves. And here's a bad move, okay? I just moved up there. Uh, and then the second iteration, there's another move. I accepted that bad move. So on only two moves, I'm out of the local minimum. So now, let's say I, uh, I, I did end up, you know, by chance, because there are a lot of bad, lot of, now a lot of good moves are accepted maybe. I ended up in the, the bottom. If any bad moves occur now, let's say I go back up, it'll require a lot more bad moves to get me out of the global minimum than it took to get me out of the uh, local minimum. So with all this bouncing around early on, it's quite likely that I'll end up in the global minimum and I'll spend more time in the global minimum than in the local minimum. Now, as the iterations proceed, of course, I say that uh, I now start to reject bad moves more frequently. So if, I'm, if I end up more often in the global minimum, and I start moving to the second phase, I'll pretty much stay there because now I'll be rejecting the bad moves. So any bad move, any bad move, I'll just reject. And I pretty much end up staying in the global minimum. So that's basically how simulated kneeling works. Uh, the question is, how is this transition implemented? Uh, well, it's implemented using um, the Boltzmann probability distribution. Probability distribution. Okay. And that's given by e to the minus then there's some, the classic one anyway, is a, there's an energy term uh, constant and then T for temperature. And this gives me the uh, probability. Okay. Now this delta E for our, so this is a, from physics. This is a, something, you know, that we pulled out from physics, but we can use it here. So this delta E is basically the change in the chi-squared effectively. Uh, K is some constant, which we can either set to one or, or give it another value. T is the important thing. Uh, T is the temperature. In physics, this is the temperature. And we'll, we'll keep that name, the temperature. Um, so let's um, imagine, what does this um, expression do depending on the temperature? So if the temperature is high, uh, the probability is roughly one. Okay, so if the temperature is high, this goes to zero, e to the zero is roughly one. If the temperature is low, then the probability will be, you know, less than one. It could be, if the temperature is really low, it could be much less than one, all right? Okay, well, maybe we can exploit this. Maybe this corresponds to the early on phase and this corresponds to the late phase, okay? In fact, we can transition smoothly between the two just by changing the temperature slowly. So maybe if we start off with a high temperature, all right, start with a high temperature, high temperature, T, then slowly decrease the temperature. Okay, that would work. So how do we make a decision though, whether to accept or reject? Because even early on, it says here that we, we will accept bad moves frequently. It doesn't mean we will always accept a bad move. But if the temp, all right, so we need to take that into account. So how about doing this? Let's say we, um, so let's say we've, we've come to this point, we've come to the no bit, right? And we, we need to go into the magic box. So this is what the magic box could do. So let's write out the magic box. This is what it'll actually do. Oops, magic box. 
So first thing we'll do is draw a random number. This will be between uh, zero and one. It'll be a uniform random number, okay? Um, now let's see if it's uh, if the temperature is high, the probability will be um, close to one. So let's say uh, let's say um, whoops, hold on for a second. Let me show the right way around. Yeah. So if let's say the random number is less than if the random number u is less than uh, e to the minus, so this is the difference chi squared, the difference now between two, two positions divided by t. If that is less than that, then we will accept. Now let's think about this. Let's say the temperature is high, okay, temp high, oops, high. That means this value is roughly about one, okay? Because temperature is high, T is high, therefore this is low. E to the low is close to one. So since U only varies between zero and one, uh, it's very likely to be uh, less than one, all right? It's very likely to be less than one. And so when the temperature is high, we'll accept that bad move and then go around and do the iteration again. Now, if it's not else, uh, we reject, okay? Um, the last thing we do, hold, remember I had, this, I had this loop here. The last thing we must do actually up here is to um, drop the temperature. So each time we go around the loop, we must drop the temperature. So it starts high and slowly, slowly decreases so that we transition from this stage to this stage, okay? So last thing I'll do is then I'll, I'll change the temperature, I'll decrease the temperature a bit down. There are various strategies for decreasing the temperature, uh, but the simple one is just to take a fixed amount of it. And when you reach you know, zero, you, that's the end of it. But there are other ways of doing it. Okay, so let's um, think about this. What happens when the temperature becomes low? So if the temperature becomes low, that means this is small. Uh, that means this is high. Therefore, this is close to zero, okay? Now it's very unlikely that U, which varies between zero and one, uh, to be near zero. It's more likely to be a 0.5 or a 0.6. Every now and then it might be a 0.01, which is, which, which, if that's the case, then we might accept. Otherwise, we'll reject. So early on in the iteration, when the temperature is high, we'll be accepting lots of bad moves. And then we'll slowly transition to a case where we start to reject the bad moves more and more. And the hope is that in accepting lots of bad moves, we will find ourselves more frequently in the global minimum because that's harder to get out of. Uh, and then as the temperature decreases, um, we'll do fewer bad moves. And if we happen to be in the global minimum, we'll find it more and more difficult to get out of it because we're not accepting bad moves. So that's basically how simulated annealing works. Um, there's a lot of material online uh, you can look at, but uh, I think that'll do for now. Okay, thanks.